I think I can fit all that in this week. But I wanted to talk, and I had a, I talked to some of the leaders and sent out a, an email to, to some folks and said, you know, I really feel like that there's something that the Lord's leading us to. And can you remember a time in your life where the fire of God was so great in you that it didn't feel like anything could put it out? Where you were so on fire for God that you just, you yearn to be in His presence and you, you long to be in prayer and you long to be in worship and you couldn't wait until you got that time alone with God just to spend it with God and Him to speak to you and you to speak to Him. And, and, and in, I believe it's a trap of the enemy when we get so busy that we don't have time for those things. And that's where in, in, a, in a relationship, whenever you lose the intimacy, you lose the relationship. In the relationship with God, when you lose the intimacy with God, you begin to fall away from the relationship. And it doesn't seem quite as important. It doesn't seem quite as significant. And you don't walk in quite as much power as what you used to walk in as whenever you have that, that intimate, divine connection that, that, just, that just walking into the presence of God just all of a sudden catches you and takes you into that place that you forgot what was going on because the Bible says in the light of His glory and the light of His grace everything else dissipates and disappears. And so my goal tonight is to help you. I think that we've already got there quite a ways, but my goal tonight is to help you move on and to stay in that place that you've experienced in the last 45 minutes of staying in the presence of God outside of the sanctuary. Hallelujah. And so when you leave here, you know that when you leave here on Wednesday nights, when you leave here on Sunday mornings, uh, many times as soon as you get out there, there's things in the world that come at you and try to attack you and try to bring you down. But I want you to remember that greater is He that is yes, in you sir. than anything that you're going to face oh, in the God. world when you go out of this place. God is greater than your doctor's report. God is greater than the financial report. God is greater than anything that you're facing. And so as I begin to, to look at this, I, I got into some deep study that we won't get into tonight. Tonight, but but I think for you Bible scholars that want to study it, uh, I'll give you a little challenge. Anybody like to go in and figure out stuff? So I would like you to uh, hear a little assignment for this week. If you get time, I know you're busy, but if you get time, go in and read the Gospels and figure out, because there's deliberation on this among scholars, if there was one cleansing of the temple or if there were two. <laughs> now, some of you Oh no, he's gone off the deep end now. Now we're going to start teaching all that. But there's one philosophy that I tend to, as I've studied this, that John talks about, whenever John talks about the cleansing of the temple was in Jesus' early ministry. When Luke talks about it, it was at the end of Jesus' ministry. Yes. And so I believe it's entirely possible that God had to cleanse the temple twice. I'm not, I don't believe it's a matter of heaven or hell whether you agree with me or whether you don't. I, I say, as a matter of fact, whenever I begin to study this, I began, as a matter of fact, whenever I first began to study it, I read what some of these people were saying, I thought, well, that's heresy. Yeah. You know, but, you know, many of us would have thought it was heresy for God to say that He loved everybody oh, years ago. And well, it, we would have thought it was heresy for God to, to not stick by the rules of religion that we were brought up with and taught up with. And so, so I want you to have an open mind, and there are, there are always going to be people that say, well, I just don't, but don't worry about it. it it's not going to hurt you. I promise it doesn't change the story of the fact that Jesus died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, rose from the dead, ascended to the right hand of God, and one of these days He's coming back for those who love Him. And so that's the story of the Gospel. But, but I want you to look at, at John chapter 2 and verse 13. John chapter 2 and verse 13. Now when the Jewish feast was, uh, a Passover was near, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found the temple courts, people selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers sitting at the tables. So he made a whip of cords and drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He scattered the coins, the money changers, and overturned the tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Take these things away from here, and do not make my father's house a marketplace. And his disciples remembered it is written, passion for your house will devour me. As a matter of fact, let me look on down. Psalms chapter 69 and verse 8 and 9 says, I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children because the zeal of your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. David was saying there's something important about the Father's house. There's something important. And that's what Jesus said. When Jesus went in many times in today's world, we have churches that are... Nothing more than social clubs. 
Nothing more than places for people to get together and to be entertained and to do all that. And, and you know what? I don't mean to, to get into uh, arguments or, or philosophies, but I, I tell you that I believe that, that many times the house of God worldwide is still being treated as a marketplace where the, re where the relationship with God is being sold for prices yes. rather than a relationship. And so I want you to get this tonight that God wants to have a relationship. And the reason that God was so con that Jesus was so concerned about the temple is that it belonged to his father's house. Can you imagine it? Take with me just, just a moment and think about this. You all come from some kind of family. Everybody here comes from a family somewhere. <clears throat> and so if you were to be away from home for a long time and you come back to your family's house and discover that thieves and robbers are living in your family's home. And disrespecting it, and they've tore it up. And they, I can tell you, somebody's in real estate, it's not uncommon to go into a house that used to be once beautiful and, and magnificent, and people have stolen. Many times I go into houses, and people have stolen breaker boxes out of the walls, and I breathe the toilets from the floors, and, and done all these kinds of things. And they tear them up. So, can you imagine what would happen if it was your house? And you went back to that house, and you discovered that it had been demolished on the inside. The outside might still look like the old house, but when you got inside of it, you discovered that it was nothing like it was supposed to be. This is exactly what happened whenever Jesus showed up at the temple. He looked around and he began to see that people were disrespecting the Lord's house. Now keep in mind, this wasn't even the first temple. This was actually the third temple that had been built. And so it, it wasn't, and so that's why it's entirely possible. How many of you know that sometimes we have to get cleansed over and over again? Yes. Amen. And so it wouldn't be uncommon, it wouldn't be unscriptural for that temple to have been cleansed twice. It wouldn't have even been unscriptural for it to have been cleansed seven times. As a matter of fact, seven times might be more scriptural if we did than, than two times. But, but, but when Jesus came in and he saw these things going on, he said, you have made this a den of thieves and robbers. You made this something it wasn't designed to be. And the heart of God was grieved. Don't you believe that sometimes the heart of God is grieved at the way that we treat the house of God? Yes. Not just in, 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 and I'm not talking about leaving stuff here and there. I'm talking about just in the disrespect that people show the house of God. In, 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 our, in our lack of worship sometimes. In our lack of prayer. and our lack of all these things. And Jesus is, is that he's not... I want you to look at this. He's not criticizing anybody for the way that they were dressed. He's not criticizing. He's simply criticizing it because he knows what the house was designed to be. Yes. And Jesus said, my house shall be called. Can anybody answer that for me? Yes. A house of prayer. Yes. For all nations. For all nations. Exactly. As a matter of fact, that's in one of my scriptures down here in a minute. If it was designed to be a house of prayer, then we have an obligation to keep it what God designed it to be. A house of prayer. It's great to have other things. You know, even though it's... And I know we've got kids in here and they're going to... But, but this is good, good scriptural teaching. The coloring of Easter eggs is actually a pagan holiday. It's what the pagans did. And Christians have adopted it. We can find all kinds of scriptures that, you know, but, you know... Good Christians can find a scripture to justify anything. I mean, that's, it's not real hard to do. And in, in this situation, she's just saying, wait a minute, you forgot what you're designed to be. I'm, I'm glad that the kids are in here tonight because I want you to know that all of you were designed to be a vessel of prayer. Yes. 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 And prayer is more important than anything else that you do in your life, more than anything else that you accomplish. And, and, and many times, grown-ups and kids begin to weigh their value according to who they are or who they came from or what job they do. But I want you to understand that everybody has equal value in the eyes of God. And we're all designed to be vessels of prayer. Vessels of prayer. And, and you can't be a vessel that something throws out of if you don't take it in. And so, look at verse 18. Still in John chapter 2. So then the Jewish leaders said to him, What miraculous signs can you show us since you're doing these things? Jesus replied, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. Then the Jewish leader said to him, that This temple has been under construction for 46 years and you're going to raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. So after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said this, that he had said this, and they believed the scripture that Jesus had said. 
Now, you know me, I like to take things a little bit to the edge. And so, I, I've told you this a many times, but we're going to say it again. This building is not the temple. This is a building that houses the temples yes. to come into. You are a spirit which has a soul which lives in a body. Yes. You're a spirit which has a soul which lives in a body. You are more. You may not understand this, and, and it was hard for uh, kids. I've, I've had a couple of uh, people ask me this week. We got into conversations, and, but I want you to understand: you are more spirit than you are flesh. You are more spirit than you are flesh. That's why the Bible talks about that. We need to. It doesn't talk a lot about the flesh. It talks more about the spirit. That our spirit needs to be right, because if our spirit's right, it begins to control the flesh rather than the flesh controlling the spirit. Whatever we get power to us, what has power? Maybe we're shouting off a heart while I go to be quiet now. Whatever we give power to is what has power. I want you to hear this. This might be a word for you tonight. Whatever you give credence to, whatever you give authority to, is what has authority. If you have children, you give them authority, they have authority, but if you don't give them authority, they don't have it. When we are facing the enemy, the en I want you to understand this. The enemy only has as much authority as you give him. Amen. Only as much authority as you give him. So when we're going around talking about, man, the devil's doing this, the devil's doing that, the devil's doing this, the devil's doing that. Well, just go ahead and praise him. Because that's kind of what we're doing when we're saying, man, the devil. You know, I, I grew up in church. You know, I've, I shared this with you before, but I mean, everything was a demonic attack. <laughs> it didn't matter what it was. It was a demonic attack. I remember years ago, uh, many years ago, I went to preach plus years, Brian, at Cross Chapel of the Rockies in Denver, Colorado. Back then it was a fairly large congregation that had about 150 people. <laughs> Before Brian came. <laughs> But there, there were there were people praying, and there was there was this one little lady just walking around the front. She, I mean, she she had her face saved by her hair tied back to Jesus, and they pulled all the wrinkles out, and she was just just walking back and forth in the front, and just just not not doing much of anything. And she looked back, and she said, "Pastor," and the other pastor was asked, "I said what?" He said, "Look," and she looked back up on that, and they had a a big banner on the back of the wall. And the air conditioning got kicked on and tilted it sideways. And she said, take authority with me. I just take authority over that spirit of crookedness right now. And I said, really? You're seriously going to rebuke the air conditioner? I won't come in agreement with it because I needed the air conditioner to work. But there are people that get so, so tied up in all this that they just blame the devil on everything. Yeah, how many of you know you can't blame the devil on your bad hair day? <laughs> you can blame that, but he don't have to take it. You can't. There are people that go around blaming the devil on the fact that they're broke. I tell people all the time, I've been broke before. I don't know what it's like. But I tell people all the time, if you want the devil to quit taking your money, quit giving it to him. Yeah. And so, well, I'm not giving the devil my money. Well, whenever you're spending your tithe on yourself, you're giving the devil your money. How many of you have, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm going to get to that script. Well, I may not be good tonight because I'm going to let you out. But, uh, but part of this even goes back to Malachi, where, where God is talking in Malachi about what's going to happen at this time in this place. And it's in that same script that he says that he rebukes the devourer from our life. How many of you know that God can rebuke the devourer from your lives? Even he thinks he can come at you, but they're not going to kill you. And, and here's, you know, whenever I begin to think about this, and Jesus responded, when, when they asked Jesus, and, and they were saying, okay, you say you can do all this, what gives you authority to come in and turn this temple upside down? Now, you think I'm not like Jesus? Jesus can take a rabbit trail just like I do. He doesn't even respond to the question. He gives a different answer. He could have said, all power and authority is given me in heaven and in the earth to clean this temple up and to drive you out. Instead, he goes out into left field. Isn't that amazing? 
And he says, you can do whatever you want to, and you can destroy this temple, but as soon as you do, I'm going to raise it up again in three days. And, they, and don't you know they look at him? He has been smoking something out of the river again. <laughs> Why, is, why would he answer that kind of... Why would he give that answer to that question? It don't have anything to do with a prostitute in China. Why would he do that? And Jesus is literally taking something. He says, okay, you've been talking about this temple, but I'm talking about a temple that is greater than this temple that you worship in. How many of you know that the Bible says that God is looking for people to worship Him in spirit and in truth, for they're the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks? And so you've got to worship Him in spirit. And so when Jesus is talking about His temple, He's, ta he's, he's literally taking it away from the conversation. Yeah, you're distracted by what's going on. I claim, came to clean up the temple. But if you want to know what kind of authority I have, watch. Because in three days, what I did to this temple is nothing compared, and this is literally what He was saying, what I've just done to this temple is nothing compared to what you are going to do to me. Nothing compared to what you are going to do to me. However, be assured, you can take down this symbol, but in three days, I'll rebuild it. Yes. Aren't you glad for the resurrection? Yes. That God is still in the power and authority today to rebuild your temple. Amen. Now, I'm going to take this down to one more level before I let you go. And, and I've got all these notes. I, I worked hard on this today and didn't know that God was going to insist on taking over worship. In the middle of all this, how important is it, do you think, that we keep our temple in tune with God? That we keep our temple. How many of you know, you know, many times we come into church and we're, we're expecting God to, to speak something to us, and, and that's great, and I want you to hear something every time. I believe that if you'll search, you can find something in every word of God that is preached, regardless of who it's preached by. The word of God don't return void. It always accomplishes and achieves the purpose for which it's sent. But if the only time that we receive the word from God is when we're in the church, then what's happening to the rest of the time? We've got to not just be a church of prayer. This is what I want to talk to you for a moment about. I don't want just a church of prayer. I want people of prayer. People of prayer. That when you come in, it's all right. We've all come into church sometimes down in the dumps. We've all come in this room sometimes. Sometimes we've come in sick. Sometimes we've come in with other things on our mind. And, and that happens from time to time, but as a whole, that's where some people are, but, but as we build ourselves up, we should come into church ready. Some people come into church and expect that I'm going to have a, one of those big machines with an air hose on it. Compressor. Yes. <laughs> well, we probably need oxygen tank too. Some, some of them come with white sometimes on one of my sermons. I don't know if they died or they just went to sleep. But, but they think that somehow they're going to come in all deflated and every service is going to pump them back up and fill them back full. And how many of you know that sometimes you've got to learn how to regulate your own pump? Yes. Sometimes, that's why the Bible says you've got to pray yourself up. Yeah. You got prayer. Now, now I'm glad that we have people of prayer, but how many of you know as people of prayer, we won't be able to pray over other people if we're not prayed up? I believe with all my heart that this is the church where God wants to bring people in and see people healed and saved and delivered and, and all these kinds of things. And you know, over that some of you probably don't even know some of the testimonies. You would be amazed at some of the testimonies that have happened in this place just over the last year that nobody said, but if you had knew where some people are and where God has brought them to right now, you wouldn't even be able to sit in your chair. It happens because the people of God are ready to pray into people what they don't have yet. But as that's prayed into you, then you build it up and you begin to pray for other people. God doesn't give you something that can just flow to you. God gives you something that can flow through you. Yes. And I want you to get this. God is getting us ready for some great and mighty things. But we've got to spend more time in prayer. That your face, Lord, will I seek. Now, I always use this illustration when I'm preaching from Matthew 6, 33. To seek means to hunt out, to search out, to, to, to find, to go beyond the ordinary effort that you would go to. Now hear this. This might be something that will help you. Sometimes the face of God isn't just going to appear before you. Sometimes you're going to have to 
go through some of the mud and some of the mire and some of the other stuff, and you're going to have to seek because sometimes if we're not in it in a regular way, on a regular basis, it becomes hidden from us, and then we have to work harder. How many of you know that when you can get to a place in God, and many of us have been there, where you didn't quite have the fire that you used to have in order to get that fire back? It didn't just come because you sat in the surface one and said, oh, it's back. <laughs> Oh, Pastor, lay hands on me. It's all better now. Lay hands on a lot of people didn't get better. Just so that you know. <laughs> well, most of them did, but some of them. If we're not praying, then all we do when we go pray for somebody, if my life is all mumble jumble mess, and I pray for you. It don't matter what I said. What's in here is what goes into you. And you just got my mom with trouble mess. Don't you hope I've been praying? <laughs> <laughs> it's important that we be people of prayer. Kids, when you go to school, you should be praying every day before you go to school that God will use you in that school to minister to other kids, to show people what Jesus is really all about. I would hate to get reports from the school that our godly kids went to school and acted a mess. And we... <laughs> if you could see the stairs from the back row. <laughs> I'm sure there's not been any reports like that all week long. But you know what? The same thing happens. We can, we can all judge the kids because it's easy to judge them, but they should know better. So should the adults. If the kids are going to school and being a great reflection of prayer, how much more should we as adults be a great reflection of prayer in our job and in our friendships and even in the grocery store? You know what? We should be so alive with prayer that God will speak to you in the middle of research. And so you need to go pray over that woman that's standing over by the list. Come, let us worship together. <laughs> I really didn't plan that, but after I saw her mouth, oh, it was the Lord, I tell you, it was the Lord. <laughs> and, she, and she says, oh, I don't believe in her. Say, oh, come on, let us reason together. <laughs> Y'all don't pay me enough to criticize me. Just listen to what I say. <laughs> How many of you know that we should be so full of prayer that God could... This had about five, six years ago, I was traveling. I was going down to Texas. And I pulled up to the toll booth. And the lady was crying when she went to take my money. And I said, ma'am, are you okay? And she says, I am just so sick and they won't let me go home. I looked at her and I said, this is your day. And she said, oh, I really don't feel like it. I said, oh, yes, it is. There were four other lanes and I came through yours. This is your day. There were cars behind me. And she said, I, don't know. I said, God sent me to pray for you. I had a pipe pass and forgot. <laughs> now, how many of you know that God used you at the right time, at the right place? And she stuck her hand out there and I took it and we prayed. And then I went on. Now, I don't know what happened, but I believe she was here and she was able to work the rest of her shift. Because God wants to use you in every situation, in every circumstance. Whenever I go into list the house, before I list the house, I pray over it. And if God doesn't give me a piece about it, I turn down the listing. Now, some of you are trying to think, is there anybody in here that he's turned down their listing? <laughs> 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 that will give you something to think about. <laughs> but here it is. If we are the temple of prayer, and we train people in prayer, and we pray over people. Now here it is. I know this sounds redundant. But if we pray over people to be prayer warriors, for God to instill in you a spirit that desires to pray more than you desire to do anything else. You know what? Some of you, and I know that this is, I, I, I have to repent because I haven't preached on it as much as what I should because some people were getting offended about it. But we need to talk more about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Yes. Yes. I don't believe you're going to go to hell if you don't have it. That would be unscriptural. But I believe you can get to heaven with a little bit more power if you got it. Now, it's not, I don't believe that there's levels of spirituality and all this because I've seen people speak in tongues that act like the devil all week long. Yes. 
I, I grew up in Pentecostal churches where it didn't, I mean, we could speak in tongues and everybody lay on the floor and scream and cry. And I'd be there big, big, big puddles of snot whenever everybody left. Get out of the parking lot. And the very person that was down there rolling in the floor was out there talking about somebody. I said, yeah, I didn't see them down there. And they're the ones that needed it. <laughs> so, it's not the, not the cure for everything, but... I believe that the church preaches on the power of the Holy Ghost is the only way that the church develops the power that it needs to have. Amen. And the more power we develop, the little things that irritate us. How many of you know when you're walking in power, whenever you're feeling good and a fly lands on your arm, you don't think a whole lot about it. You brush the fly off. But if you're feeling bad, you'll look at that fly and say, oh, probably had that <laughs> virus thing that's going on. Mosquito. Yeah. But whenever you're feeling good, you just slap that thing and wipe it off. I mean, I somebody said last week, I think, or last year, I think it was one of Roy's nieces said, I want to be so full of the power of God that when a mosquito bites me, it says, ooh, that was the blood. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you, you want to be so full of power that when, when you're really walking in power, the little things that used to bother you and upset you and turn your world upside down and you would have a nervous breakdown over it and you'd bawl and squall and cry to everybody and tell everybody how your life was going to hell in a handbasket. But when you're walking in real power, those things come in. You, you say, it rains on the just and the unjust, but I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. I am an overcomer. I'm going to overcome this and I'm not going to let what somebody else said, what somebody else did or didn't do, how somebody else did or didn't treat me. I'm not going to let any of that stuff in here because I'm filled with power and my power comes from God and not from them. And so I'm going to walk in authority. When we begin to walk in the authority, it is a result of the prayer time that we had. Nobody has ever walked in the authority of God without spending time in prayer. And nobody has ever spent time in prayer without walking in authority. Why do you think he came in and said, listen, this is not what it's supposed to be like. I believe that if God showed up in some churches today, he would say, you've got it all wrong. Yeah, the lights are wonderful. Yes, it's nice that you have the big choir. Yes, it's nice that your parking lot is full. But where's the power? I would rather have a small church that walks in authority and walks in power than a large one that never feels any when we move into that place, God comes in and says, listen, you're doing the right thing. And now, how many of you know the Bible says that if you're faithful in the little things, He'll yes. make you a ruler over many. Yes, sir. Yes. Can I give you a Chuck chapter 4? Sure. When you're faithful in a little prayer, God will make you a ruler over miracles. When you're faithful in much prayer, God will make you ruler over signs and wonders. Because the Bible says, signs and wonders. Will yes. follow. Who, who do they follow? After those that believe. Yes. So if I come into God and, and say, well, you know, what it was, what it was, I didn't get anything, I didn't know what it was. Look behind you, I promise you, there's nothing there. Yes. But when you start walking in authority... I believe that signs and wonders not only follow you, but signs and wonders are in you. Yes. And you can speak literally the very oracles of God into existence as you begin to pray and you begin to speak. Yes, there may be reports that you didn't like. Anybody in here ever got a report you didn't like? Whether it was from your doctor or your job or whatever it was. But how many of you believe the report of the Lord? And the report of the Lord says, I am healed. I am free. I am delivered. I am set free. I am more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That is the report of the Lord. And so if I'm listening to the Lord's report, I really don't care what anybody else's report says. Now, I realize that I wasn't, wasn't in the you know, wasn't necessarily obedient in some physical ailments that had pressed on me the last few weeks. But I'm working on it. Y'all pray for me, and when you get perfect, you let me know and I'll follow you. <laughs> but I'm getting there. Today, I started drinking water. Oh, bottled water. Doesn't have any flavor. You shed it off you to the <laughs> I passed the diet, Dr. Pepper. I passed the lemonade. I passed all this stuff. And still got a bottle of water. Yeah. 
And now every time I sneeze, stuff squishes around on my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just believe it's loosening it up, and sooner or later, it's all going to come out. <laughs> what happens that tomorrow's schedule my MRI? I don't think I need to go. <laughs> Y'all are not encouraging me. I have. <laughs> Hey, I believe the Lord can bless me in whatever I wear. In fact, when I was little, I had one of those suit coats with little shorts on it. <laughs> but there's no... Now, I promise you, I will still go get checked out. Because that's what I tell people. Even when you believe you're healed, let's use the doctor's report to solidify it, to show it. But last week, I couldn't even pick it up. And today... That's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, that was my key. Now, it's in progress. I can get down on this knee and use this knee to get up. Last week, you can ask her, I cried. I think I had a little accident whenever I tried to do that. <laughs> but you know what? I just kept believing. I just kept saying, Lord, I know you feel this. I know you feel this, Lord. I am not. I'm not criticizing other people that have had to have it because a lot of people do. But I decide, Lord, I am not going to have surgery on this knee. I do not need surgery. I speak against it. I don't. I, I, I told somebody today they, they were talking to me. They said, you know, you need to go ahead and get some of these stuff. I said, I don't have time to be sick. That's for sick people. <laughs> I ain't sick. That's like telling me I need to be delivered from something I don't need to be delivered of. You know? And part of that, I still believe in going to the doctor, but I believe that my confession seals my faith. Amen. And so I can go around saying, man, because I've had people, people do it before, man, I know surgery's coming. I know surgery's coming. I can feel it. My mama had to have surgery. My grandma had to have surgery. My grandpa had to have surgery. They've all had to have this kind of surgery. I know what's going to happen to me. You keep speaking out, that probably would. But I'm just saying, you know what? I walk in the authority of God. I'm not going to have that. I had a guy in my office yesterday. I stopped by my killer to drop off some papers. And, and he was talking, and, and he noticed my situation. He said, you know, I don't know how you do it. He said, you know, I am just, he said, my dad died of, uh, of colon cancer, and so did my grandpa, and I know I have colon cancer. I said, why do you think you have colon cancer? He said, because everybody gets it, my colon's been hurting. <laughs> I get great encouragement right here. I didn't tell him how to fix his colon. For those of you that are... <laughs> I really stuck on subject that day. Unlike what I do here at the office, I can bust out a contract. <laughs> but I said, just because your dad had it and your grandpa had it, that doesn't mean you're going to get it. And he said, but, but what about all the symptoms? I said, have you ever had symptoms of other things before? He said, yeah. I said, you know what? You need to start speaking the truth about yourself. He said, you sound just like my wife's parents. <laughs> I said, they must be Christians. He said, yes. Every <laughs> Sunday they try to be Christians. I said, why don't you go with them next Sunday and when you get there, tell that pastor, would you agree with me that I don't have colon cancer? He said, well, why I said, because you need to call things as though they, as God says that they are. And God says you're healed. And yes, things come. But you know what? If you keep saying that, you're going to get sicker. How many of you know that when you're sick, you'll get sicker if you keep talking about how sick you are? Yes. You know, when your head hurts, if you keep, if every time you turn around, you say, oh, my head hurts, my head hurts, my head hurts, you, it'll make it worse. But the power that God gives you to walk in is authority. How many of you are ready to walk in authority and stop listening to the lies that the enemy puts in your head? Yes. 
Stop listening to the lies that the enemy puts in your head and the lies that even other people try to tell you. Because other people try to tell you, well, you know, that runs in your family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I have another dad. Yeah. Yeah. His son was a Jewish carpenter and took care of all my disease on the cross. And so I, I know I, I might have done what they said they did. I don't have what they say I have. Yeah. I'm not going to live like I say I should have to live. I'm going to live healthy. I'm going to enjoy my life. I'm not just going to get through. Christians are not designed just to get through. Come on, Pastor. Christians are not. I, I, I put this little post on Facebook this morning about enjoying every moment of your life, so that when you get to the and now, and here's a bad bad report. It's a good report, but it can be interpreted bad. That here's the bad news: all of you in here, at someday, looking around to make sure I'm okay. Everybody in here someday is going to die, but not tomorrow, and not next week, and not next year. But we can begin to speak it over ourselves and begin to bring that kind of stuff on and pretty soon you'll feel like you are dying. That's why the Bible says in the peace of God. Yes. Which part does it, does it just get to your understanding and help you out? No. It says it passes your understanding. Yes. How does it do that? By spending more time in prayer. We've all been places. We've all heard things. These are all the notes I didn't use. <laughs> but hear me. The more time you spend in prayer, the more power you will walk in. Can I give you an encouragement tonight? Before you email people, before you text them, before you pick up the phone, go to the throne. Hallelujah. Before you start, I am convinced. You know, there are people that tell me, I, believe it or not, I talk a lot when I'm up here. You get me in a crowd of people where we're just all sitting around, I promise you, I'm the quietest one of the bunch. It's not an act, I promise you. <laughs> uh, I tell everyone, the anointing's not there, I'm quiet. Now, sometimes I push it a little bit, but only from up here. But listen, one of the things that I'm very careful about is that I don't want to go around telling everybody all my stuff. I want you to understand this because there are people that, that can identify this. It's not that we don't have stuff. Everybody agree with that? It's not that we don't have stuff. Not that we don't have issues. We just don't need to advertise it. Because when people look at me, I want them to see the miracle that God did in 2007. Not the mess that they could think of if I said, oh, I don't feel good. I got this, I got that, I got that. I want people to look at me and say, man, that man walks in power. That man walks in I want people to look at me and say, man, that woman, that man, they walk in power. Somebody says, well, you know, I, I need to be able to vent. <laughs> He's touched by the feelings of your infirmities. Vent to him all you want. There are many times that people seek out relationships with people to substitute the lack of relationship with God. Now, I'm not beating you up. Because many of us have done that. There were times, act like you're surprised about this. There were times in my past that I sought acceptance any way I could get it. People do that sometimes. And whenever I realized that I didn't have to win anybody else's acceptance, it was easy for me to back away from that stuff. Like, Wait, I don't have to be like that. I don't have to react like that. We all don't let anybody fool you. The Bible even says we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us here are perfect. None of us are going to be until we get to heaven. However, the more time and prayer we spend, the more alert we're going to be not only to what we're saying to God, but the more alert we're going to be to what God is saying to us. And how many of you believe that God can speak one word, one word and change the whole thing? When he was out on the boat, 
And the winds and the waves were coming up and people were beginning to panic. And everybody else on the boat said, Lord, you've got to do something. Why are you down here sleeping? We're about to drown. Don't you understand? We're about to go down. He stepped out of the boat and looked around for Peace. I believe with all my heart before he ever got to be still, it stopped. Sometimes, understand this, you need to go to God for yourself. You need to go to God for other people. And sometimes going to, going to other people about other people is not going to God about other people. We need to go into God's place and say, Lord, I need to throw this out on you. Can I ask you a question tonight? Do you all believe that God's shoulders are big enough to carry your load? I believe that He is. Whatever you're facing, whatever circumstance you're going through, God is big enough to carry your load. That's why it says, cast some of your cares on Him. Just stand if you're awake. Cast most of your cares on Him. Cast all your cares on Him. Why? Because even if you feel like nobody else does, He cares for you. Yes. He cares for you. Have you ever been to that place where you felt like nobody really cared whether you live or die? Yeah. I promise somebody does. I promise you. Not only does this pastor care, but God cares. You're not in this by yourself. God brought you here tonight by divine appointment so that you could hear a word of encouragement to tell you draw close to Him. God is not going to run from you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, get rid of the guilt, get rid of the shame, get rid of all those things that you put in your mind, draw close to Him. Guess what He's going to do? Just like the prodigal son, He's going to draw close to you. The psalmist David said, there's nowhere I can go to escape the presence of God. If I go down to the valley, He's there. If I go up to the, wherever I go, He's already there waiting us. Why? Because they care so much about you, He won't let you go anywhere by yourself. He cares for you. Spend as much. When somebody cares for you and, and you have a, a good right, you love to talk to them. Now, sometimes it's a quiet talk. You know, after you're, some people, you can just be in the same room. Just, I don't need to talk. Just, yeah, I remember whenever I was sick. You never know whenever you're sick, you don't necessarily want to hear a whole lot of voices and a whole lot of people trying to have conversations. You know, when you're sick and people have a lot of conversations with you and you don't want to. You've been there when everything. Can't talk. Whenever I was sick, just knowing people were in the room that were praying for me, that were reading scriptures over me. That's all I needed. That's why some people have asked me, why did you do that? I wish I did. Maybe I could help somebody else. But I know whenever I woke up, I decided I no longer needed a machine breathing for me. That's why I took it out. I knew that God had me covered. Now, did I have all my senses about me? Not for weeks. <laughs> that wasn't necessary. That kind of encouragement discourages me. <laughs> but understand this. God sees you no matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through, and all He needs is just some time for you to talk to Him and Him to talk to you. And I promise... When you become, not only is this the house of prayer, but when you become the temple of prayer, yes. the authority you're going to walk in, the power you're going to live in, doesn't mean you're not going to feel bad some days, doesn't mean things aren't going to happen to you, but you just know that God's got it all under control. Would you look at somebody right now, right in their face, and say, God has everything under control? Yes. Hallelujah. Why don't you stand to your feet? Father, we thank you for your word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. We thank you that you have blessed us with more than what we could ever ask you for. We thank you for the infilling of the Holy Ghost in this place. And Father, I speak right now for those that are in this place that do not have that yet and those that listen to this podcast. Father, those that desire, Father, you said that those that hunger and thirst after righteousness would be filled. And so, Father, I ask that you just endue your people with power. 
Give them the power that they need to, to pray, to walk in authority, to, to rest not on their own understanding, but to acknowledge you in all of their ways. And Father, tonight, as we before we leave this place, we just shake off every weight and every circumstance that would so easily distract us and beset us and keep us from being the people of power and authority that you called us to be. And Father, we ask you tonight to show us what we need to do, what we need to say, what we need to pray, what we need to read, what we need to do, and where we need to do it at, Father, so that we can be the people you have called us to be. And we'll give you the praise and glory because you're the only one that deserves it. In Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen. Amen.